Yo, today I'm going to take you through my typical full day of eating when on a cut. However, we're going to go a little bit deeper into the specific qualities of the food shown because there's only one thing more important than having big biceps and that is knowledge. So I'm going to focus mainly on the good, but there are also plenty of potential negative effects to a lot of the foods I'm going to show. So I'll mention a couple of those just for good measure. I could basically sum up 90% of those bad points by just saying that in a nutshell, everything pretty much gives you cancer. Pretty sure just being alive gives you cancer. But anyway, after that truly uplifting introduction, I want to thank Squarespace once again for sponsoring this video. More on that later, but for now, let's talk about food and stuff. Before I start, I just want to drive home the main two requirements of any diet aimed at fat loss. Number one, the individual must maintain a calorie deficit, i.e. must consume fewer calories than they burn. Number two, the individual must consume adequate protein, fats and micronutrients to sustain overall health as well as exercise, performance and recovery because there's no point losing weight if you're going to die or equally as terrible, lose all your gains. There are a few different ways you can set your calories from methods as simple as multiplying your weight in pounds by 13 to 15 depending on activity levels to the slightly more complex method of using the Harris Benedict equation to estimate your maintenance calories before subtracting 500 to put you in a deficit. Both of these are only going to give you estimates. The right number of calories is one that allows you to lose weight at a rate of 0.5 to 1% of your total body weight per week. So the absolute best method is trial and error, monitoring and adjusting as you go. My calories will be 2,400 and that is made up of 150 grams of protein, 80 grams of fat and 270 grams of carbs. I weigh about 170 pounds right now so that is just under 1 gram of protein per pound of body weight and around 0.5 grams of fat per pound of body weight and the rest of the calories are filled up with carbs. I will spare all of my old subscribers the pain of hearing me go through how I got to those for the millionth time, but I've linked videos as well as some studies in the description so you can check them out if you want more detail on that. I'm dividing my calories into 4 meals because that is the maximum number I can get away with while still having decent portion sizes. I would be clutching at straws if I tried to justify that scientifically as there is mixed evidence regarding the relationship between the number of meals and satiety. You should probably, and real emphasis on probably because it's far from certain, split up your protein into roughly equal hits over 4 or more meals. That's based on evidence regarding how much protein is needed to maximise muscle protein synthesis, but as you'll see, the majority of mine is actually split over the first three meals because I'm an absolute rogue and I just consider much of these finer details as not really worth splitting hairs over. Alright, let's do some food. Okay, first meal of the day is a fairly low carb breakfast just because I like to save my carbs for later in the day. This will consist of three whole eggs and 100ml of egg white scrambled in butter with some sun dried tomatoes and fresh basil. We also have some smoked paprika, turmeric, dried oregano, oregano and finally some black pepper. Egg whites have the highest biological value of all protein apart from whey which in layman's terms means a higher proportion of what you eat actually gets used. They're not particularly nutrient dense but they do contain some potassium, vitamin A, B12, D and also B2 otherwise known as riboflavin which is needed to help prevent some eye conditions like cataracts and macular degeneration. The real nutrient powerhouse is the egg yolk which happens to be the most concentrated source of choline which your liver, brain and nervous system need to regulate memory, mood, muscle control and just loads of other shit. According to the National Institute of Medicine you need between 450 to 550 milligrams per day and a single egg yolk provides you with around 125 milligrams. They also contain a lot of tryptophan, which is a precursor to serotonin, melatonin and vitamin B3. Literally could go on forever here, but let's keep moving. And no, I don't really want to get embroiled in a cholesterol debate, but feel free to spar with each other in the comments. Alright, turmeric's pretty cool right now, let's talk about that. So, there is evidence to suggest anti-inflammatory properties as well as potential use as pain relief and even in cancer treatment. It's actually the curcuminoids in turmeric that seems to be the active component and curcumin typically makes up only 2-6% to of turmeric. So, it does seem that the effective dose required to reap the benefits is so high that you are actually unlikely to get it through diet and so maybe curcumin capsules would be better. However, the piperine in black pepper increases the bioavailability of curcumin by 2000%. So basically eat them together and you will get more of the positive effects from the curcumin slash turmeric.
Okay, after breakfast, I'm just having an apple and a tangerine. Key apple fact. A study by Delaney et al. showed that an intake of one apple per day is an effective method of medical professional deterrent. Tangerines are pretty sick, aren't they? Basically a little orange for people who don't have fingernails. Anyway, the tangerine hails from Tangier, Morocco, and one small one contains a third of your daily vitamin C requirement, which is good for your skin, blood vessels, bones, and cartilage, and most of all, prevents scurvy. I think that's the shit that pirates get. Okay, meal two is pretty simple and consists of some fat-free Icelandic yogurt, some high bran cereal and some blueberries. Let's talk about high bran. This shit looks a bit grim, but it is the god of fiber, specifically the wheat bran it contains. It's been linked to reduced risk of colon cancer, likely due to the high fiber content. You can see I ended on 47 grams of fiber for the day and diets high in fiber generally help to lower blood pressure and serum cholesterol levels, plus a load of other good shit. Some, but certainly not all, types of fiber have also been linked with increased satiety, which might make it easier to stick to your calories if you're cutting like me. And wheat bran has been associated with improved digestive function and decreased reported feelings of bloatedness. So. The next time you see an Insta girl posting about bloating, you can tell her to eat some wheat bran. So the big one we hear about dairy is that it's good for your bones. You will see studies like this, but then you scroll down and also see this. I'm gonna just stay out of that for now. It definitely does contain a lot of calcium and also B12, and if you become deficient in B12, well, that can proper fuck you up, mate. This particular skier also contains a smashing 46 grams of protein, so that is nice. Blueberries contain outrageous levels of anthocyanin, which seems to be anti-cancerous. Basically, everything is either giving you cancer or stopping you from getting cancer. The antioxidants in blueberries also appear to aid brain function and delay mental decline. Right then, before the gym, I am having a pre-workout snack, which is a pack of beetroot. Beetroot is high in nitrates, which can protect against cardiovascular disease, but more importantly, have actually been shown to help improve athletic performance. Fun fact, basil, coriander, or cilantro to you Americans, and rocket, or aragula as you may call it, are all higher in nitrates than beetroot. However, it is really hard to consume substantial amounts of those since they're all just leaves, so stick with the beetroot. Nitrates are vasodilators, which is why you see them in pump products or pre-workouts. Post-workout meal, let's do this shit. Chicken breast, just a source of protein, really. But I will change tone for a second and throw in some potentially negative stuff. So, chicken has been found to contain phthalates, phthalates, <laughs> which are man-made esters, mainly used in plastics and PVC. These are thought to be bad for male reproductive development when pregnant women are exposed to them and have also been shown to correlate with higher BMI and higher waist circumference. One cross-sectional study found an inverse relationship between phthalate exposure and testosterone levels, which could obviously relate back to the aforementioned. Okay, let's lighten up a bit. Tender stem broccoli is my favorite green veg, primarily because it tastes great and I like that you can just fry it easily rather than chopping up a head of broccoli and steaming it. Anyway, nutritionally, they are both pretty similar, but tender stem has way more vitamin A. Most of us get enough of this, but deficiencies are common in less developed countries. Potatoes are the king of satiety, provided you boil them, and they also contain more potassium than broccoli or bananas, which is important for you to be able to generate nerve impulses and therefore muscle contractions. I use sesame oil to flavor the broccoli, but since it has a low smoke point, it is one of the oils that you don't want to actually fry in, because guess what happens when it's heated and starts to break down molecularly? 
It results in more carcinogens, yay, so basically just more cancer. Anyway, on the flip side, if you don't do that, <laughs> sesame oil is around 80% unsaturated fatty acids, particularly omega-6, and this study showed it to have a greater effect on reducing LDL levels than olive oil. Some animal studies have also suggested anti-inflammatory effects. Final meal of the day is porridge oats or oatmeal to the Americans. These contain high levels of melatonin, which is thought to help with sleep and certain sleep disorders. I'll also throw a banana in there, which contains tryptophan, which is again thought to impact sleep through being a precursor to melatonin, as well as magnesium. People with magnesium deficiencies often experience insomnia as a symptom. Finally, peanut butter, mainly because it goes well with a banana, but if you get some natty stuff, it's also pretty good for you. Half of the fat in PB is oleic acid, which is also the main fat source in olive oil, and it has a beneficial effect on insulin sensitivity. But let's not get ahead of ourselves just yet. Peanuts actually grow underground where they are colonized by mold and exposed to aflatoxins, and guess what they do? You guessed it, they give you cancer. They also might be linked to mental retardation, which is obviously not ideal, but on the bright side, the actual production of peanut butter, like the roasting process and the blanching process and all that, it does seem to dramatically reduce the levels of aflatoxins. Yo people, hope you enjoyed the video. Before we go, I just want to talk about Squarespace who are kindly sponsoring this video once again. Squarespace is an all-in-one website platform that makes building your own website super easy, mate. They have loads of cool templates that you can use to get started and then you can customize those templates pretty much however you want so that your website isn't going to end up looking like anybody else's. If you're a PT or anything like that, they even have features that will allow clients to book appointments or sessions straight through your website. And you can also set up email campaigns with newsletters or if you're having any particular sales or anything like that. You can basically do whatever you want. So if you need a website, check out squarespace.com and start a free trial because it's free. And then when you are ready to get started, you can use the link Squarespace dot com forward slash joe delaney and that will get you 10 percent off your first order all right thanks for watching see you later mate joe delaney is my hero